Holy God, hope of all of our years, by your Holy Spirit, illumine these words this day. Open us to the power of your word proclaimed so we may live into the fullness of this life. Amen. In the last weeks, certainly the last few days, I have been living with the tension of grief and hope. Maybe some of you have too. I have devoured the 24-hour news cycle and most of our Halloween candy. There has been a restlessness in my soul. Some of you have shared with me some of your worries and your fears and your struggle to find a center place, a balance, a stronghold for your lives in this time. And in our nation today, we are all aware of the many pandemics that plague us. And there is grief, and there is sorrow, and there is pain. And yet there are those of you who woke up and took a large exhale yesterday, rejoiced yesterday with an announcement of a new president and vice president-elect, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And even as votes are still being counted, this was certainly an historic moment in our nation. The very first woman, the first woman of color, the first woman of Asian American descent to be the country's vice president-elect. And yet, there are others who are grieved this day with the news of the defeat of our incumbent president, Donald Trump. And so, our nation continues on a divide, a split along party lines. We could not be more divided. And the challenge, therefore, of healing a nation and rebuilding any sense of national identity or shared core values stands in the balance. There is much between grief and hope this day. This week, I came across the words of presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, Michael Curry. His recent book, Love is the Way, Holding on to Hope in Troubling Times, explores what the way of love looks like, even as we walk in a world that feel, feels at times closer to a nightmare than to a dream. The way of love is how we stay decent in indecent times. It's for all of us who are sitting and looking around at our leaders saying, something is wrong. It's for those who have been fighting for a better world and feeling lonely and defeated and very, very tired. Well, all of our scripture passages this morning speak to a deep urgency in the life of the world. It is a frighted moment of deep urgency. Awaiting a bridegroom's arrival, new life called forth with hope, a narrative about whom to choose in one's life to follow. These texts provide an opportunity for a community of faith such as ours to think about our treasure, our heart, our passion, our deep purpose that runs far deeper than any political election. In the passage from the book of Joshua that Drew read this morning a few moments ago, God chose Joshua to lead the Israelites. Joshua has been a good leader. But his time was near, and he realized he was about to die. Joshua speaks to the Israelites in the hope that he can point them in the right direction. He cannot help them forever, but he can at least set them on the right course before he dies. He recounts all of the good things that God has done for them. Choosing Abraham as a father of a great nation, blessing him with a son, helping them escape famine and tyranny, making clear passage through a great escape route, feeding them in the desert, protecting them against adversaries. The Israelites clearly had reason to trust the Lord. And so Joshua took an opportunity to challenge them. He says, choose this day who you will serve. Choose, make a decision. Do not choose foreign gods who will lead you astray. Follow the God of Abraham the God who 
brought you out of Egypt and protected you and fed you, the challenge for God's people is to choose whom they will serve. In our polarized, media-driven world, we too are challenged to remember who we serve. It may be difficult for us to name the false gods that we serve, for those who have our control, for those who have our attention, our allegiance, those who keep us away from the deeper relationship with the one true God. You may already know what keeps you from fully committing to a life that has God at its center. And yet we come to the end of the liturgical year, the lectionary texts become more urgent. And if you haven't felt the sense of urgency outside in the world, in our, outside of our community of faith, we are certainly hearing it today. We are hearing messages about staying alert, keeping watch, getting your house in order, preparing for what is to come. Beloved Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann suggests that we know from this ongoing election count in America this weekend that we are at a new beginning of something new because God's economy will not wait. I love how he talks about that. God's economy will not wait. We have to pay close attention in the midst of our lives because God is doing a new thing. When our focus is on God, there can be a revival of love as a guide for our living, for relationships, for leaders, for our individual and collective spirits, and our physical and mental and spiritual well-being. Bishop Curry would say, only God is God. None of us are. While we must be discerning, love is the ultimate criteria for that. Our job isn't to tell anybody how they should work out their relationship with the living God. Our job is to love. And in the case of Christians, he says, to witness to the way of love that came to us in the teachings of Jesus. When we are not our best selves, when our rhetoric gets the better of us, when the pundits drive even our curiosity and our decision-making, it is easy to forget who Christ taught us to care about and who Christ taught us to love. But when we are at our best, we have an opportunity to live into that hope provided us in Jesus Christ if we are open and willing to go. Well, the passage from 1 Thessalonians this morning is about sort of this balance of grief and hope. And where does love fit in? Grief and hope. Do not be uninformed about what is going on around you, Paul says. Don't grieve like those around you, but hold fast to something greater. Grieve as if you have hope. In another word, God is inviting us to hold on to hope because it offers us creative ways to view the world. In that... There is power for new life. New life because God is in it and a part of it and calling us forth to a new thing. The hope we hold doesn't have to be some epic conquering event to proclaim a victory of any kind or more than we think of hope, the more we can come to believe that in the small things, the powerful stories of hope can arise. So I want to share with you some words from Debbie Thomas. She's a blogger and a director of family ministries at a church in California. And she offered these words that I share with you. I share them because in the midst of turmoil and anxiety and fear and uncertainty that continues in our time together, in our time surrounding the future of our country, in the battle of the coronavirus pandemic, and in the centuries-long plague of racism and systemic oppression of Black, Indigenous, people of color, these words bring comfort. They offer hope. For God is doing a new thing. 
She writes these words as she journeys with her young adult son who had a, um, a bicycle accident and two years later continues to battle with the effects of chronic pain. Here's how she talks about hope. She says, when I read biblical stories of hope, the one that resonate are, not, are no longer the stories of epic victories and grand celebrations. Those are lovely, but they don't speak to where I live. Instead, I take hope in the story of Sarah, 99 years old and pregnant and laughing her head off because she thought for sure she was too old and wise and jaded to ever again be surprised by God. I take hope in the story of Hagar, a slave woman dying of thirst in the desert, who even in her abandonment becomes the first person in the Bible to name God. I take hope in the story of Hannah, who cries so hard and so earnestly in the presence of God that people take her for a disrespectful drunk. I take hope in the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus, who ponders hard, deep mysteries in her heart. I take hope in the persistent widow who pounds down the door of a corrupt judge day after day after day, insisting on justice until she drives the man nuts. I take hope in the story of Mary Magdalene, who refuses to budge even when evil, tragedy, death, and despair seem to have won the day. She goes on. What these stories suggest is that hope isn't about magical results. It's about the long haul and the long darkness. Hope, she says, is robust and muscular and ferocious and long-suffering. That hope never gets so cynical that it can't be surprised. That hope finds and names God in the world's most desolate places. That hope kneels on hard ground and yearns without shame. That hope ponders and meditates and ruminates. That hope gets in apathy's face and says, no, not good enough, try again. Hope sits in the darkness, out waiting torture and humiliation, crucifixion and death until finally a would-be gardener shows up at dawn and calls us by name." Unquote. People of God, we do not go through these days without hope. In times like these, we hope not because things are even close to being okay, but because the God of the small and the mundane calls us forward. Slowly and cautiously, we live with the mystery of the already and the not yet kingdom of God. Yes, the kingdom is already come, and its inbreaking during Jesus' time on earth was marked by all kinds of signs and wonders. And yet, it's hard to see those in a daily reality. So the great sorrow and the great calling for us is to live graciously and compassionately in this vast and terrible in-between. To offer the comfort of a steady presence. To ask others to hope when you don't have energy to get through another step of another day. To pray into the mystery of things that make little sense. Into what looks like and feels like a dark and desolate grave. Thomas suggests... After all, what else is hope? Isn't it precisely the mystery that strains toward what I don't yet have? Isn't it all about the unseen and the unknown and the unreached? If I already had what I longed for, I wouldn't need to hope, unquote. Therefore, beloved, what do we do in these days? It is hope that is a tether, a sure footing, a solace. It's a bridge wider and sturdier than we imagined it would be. And it connects us still to the God who loves us, each and every one of us in Jesus Christ. May this new thing, 
lead us to be the people that God calls us to be. More importantly, now more than ever, healers, repairers of the breach, peacemakers for our community and the world. So people of God, do not be like those who grieve without hope, because the God of our salvation, of our living,